Seems to be some damage here. Nothing too bad, but if I don't do something about it, it could cause real problems when I finally get to fly this plane out of here. How am I going to seal it? No, oh, I have to get back to this in a moment. I'll have to answer the science line. What's going on out there? Stella, I wonder if you can help us. Look at my skin. Is it the same skin I was born with? And if I get a paper cut, how come that after a few days, I can't even see where the cut happened? And as we grow, what happens to our skin? Does it just stretch? And if there is extra skin, where does it come from? Stretchy skin. Leave it with me. I'm off to the cave. Skin covers our whole body in a protective layer, which keeps body fluids in and microbes out. Now, skin is made of cells. And in fact, our skin, our eyes, our organs, every living thing is made of cells. And it's the same with animals and plants. Now, if you look closely enough, you can see them. They're like the building blocks of life. Some cells, like the ones in this red onion, for example, can be seen under an ordinary microscope. To find the right layer, you need to cut a few centimetres into the onion. And if you look at one of these inner layers, on about 50 times magnification, you can clearly see the cells. But can we see any of our own cells? Now, I must do this right. Cotton buds. On this cotton bud, I've got some of my cheek cells. I'm going to use some of this blue stain because it helps show up the cells. And then put on the cover slip. There. And at a thousand times magnification, you can see the individual cells. Most cells are smaller than these. The average cell is one thirtieth of a millimetre, which means that if this brick is the size of one cell, then this many, 30, can fit into this space. Cells have lots of different parts to them, but there are three important parts they all have. The nucleus, surrounded by jelly-like stuff called cytoplasm and an outer layer or membrane. But what do these things actually do? I think it's time Howie investigated. The best thing about my investigations, in fact, one of the best things about science, is that sometimes you get to be really messy. But Maria, seriously, why are we collecting all this green slime? Well, Howie, that's not just green slime. That's actually a marine algae. And it's made up of loads of little cells. It's helping me to find out something about the pollution along this coastline. You mean, in my hand, I'm holding thousands of individual cells? Not just thousands of cells, probably millions. So it's back to Maria's lab at Plymouth University to take a closer look. Well, it just so happens I have a magnifying glass. Ah, uh, still can't see anything. Perhaps I need to take the magnification up a bit. Mm. How about a microscope? Well, I've got a magnification now of about a thousand times, and I can see lots of little blobs. Well, each one of those blobs is an individual cell, and if we want to see those bigger now, we ought to go and look with an electron microscope. <laughs> picture here you can see the sheet of cells of the algae. We can see that sheet of cells has been split across the top to open it up for us and see the individual cells now with a magnification of over 1,500 times. That's incredible actually isn't it? I mean I'm looking at that. That means that ooh, about there to there 
is going to be the equivalent of a pinhead. That's right, yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Really can, we, can we go any tighter? Yeah. yeah, we can get even bigger here. OK, now we've got the cell here magnified over 13,000 times. And here we can see that this cell is slightly different from an animal cell in that it's got this cell wall on the outside. All the way around the cell, we've got the cell wall. Now, apart from a plant cell's outer wall, the algae cell is actually very similar to all cells. There's the protective membrane around the cell, the nucleus, which acts like the nerve centre controlling everything that goes on in the cell, and the cytoplasm, where chemicals and food are made. So, out of all this, what part of the cell are you particularly interested in? Well, I'm particularly interested in this outer cell membrane that's holding the whole cell together. It's a very important part of the cell structure because it controls the entry uh, and exit of chemicals into and out of the cell. If it becomes damaged, for example, by a pollutant, then it loses that control of chemicals that enter and leave the cell. So, if the cell's membrane has been damaged by pollution, chemicals in the cytoplasm, including potassium, will leak out. We can use this experiment to see how much potassium has leaked from the algae cells gathered at a test site and then compare the results with a controlled sample of algae that we know hasn't been affected by pollution at all. So, Maria, what do these figures actually tell us? Well, these figures, how we actually look quite good. They show that the algae from the site that you collected it from is actually quite healthy. Why is that important? Why are you looking at algae? Well, algae are a good indicator of pollution. They're static. They can't move away from the pollution. Also, they're a very important part of the food chain. Other organisms depend on them. Which means lots and lots of testing, no matter what the weather. No rest for the serious scientist. Let's go out and work, work, work. Oh, no, you go, mate. <laughs> Don't mind me. I'm just going to go and get some algae. Oh, I love it. I think I'm algae. Oh, no, 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 no. So if the scientists check for potassium leaks in the algae cytoplasm... Then that must mean the cell is made up of even smaller stuff. Well, it must be made up of molecules. And maybe those molecules are made up of something smaller. Stella, is that right? Cells, like everything else, are made of atoms which combine with other atoms to make molecules. And it's these molecules that make up the membrane, the cytoplasm and the nucleus. It's a bit like this cup is a cell and the sugar is some of the millions of atoms and molecules in it. Now, the algae was made up of one cell. But what about us? Now, this is me as a child. But how do we get from a child to a grown-up? Well, we grow in size because the number of our cells increases, not because the cells we started with as a baby simply grew bigger. But how? How we? Somewhere amongst these tanks at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory is Fred Fretzum, the man responsible for these little creatures. This is a sea urchin. Compared to me, it's tiny, but it's made up of millions of cells. Amazingly, though, it came from just one, and that's something that's definitely worth investigating. So, Fred, you spend a lot of time with sea urchins. Where do all those cells come from? Well, Howie, like all living creatures, Sea urchins started off as one cell, and over a period of time, the cell multiplies and divides, and we wind up with one of these little beauties. But how can one cell grow into all of that? And where did that one cell come from? Ah, uh, well, to find that out, I think we really need to go back to the beginning of the life of the sea urchin. The single cell we're talking about is produced by other sea urchins. Now, we have the female sea urchin which produces an egg. The other is the male urchin which produces the sperm. Now, these cells are normally called half cells. Now, when the egg is fertilized by the sperm, they come together and they form one cell. All this happens naturally in the sea, but I can also do it in the lab if I take some seawater, 
and then add urchin eggs and sperm to it. Once the eggs are fertilised, becoming a whole cell, something very special happens. So, that cell will now divide in, say, about half an hour, sometimes maybe an hour, and into two. And then it, the two will divide into four, four into eight, and so on. The urchin grows like many other multicelled animals and plants. Each cell in them divides into two new cells, and these cells each divide into two new cells, and so on and so on, until you have literally thousands and millions and billions of new cells. In fact, it only takes an urchin about a day to go from a single cell to the thousands of cells that make up these little baby urchins. Well, that actually looks like a proper animal already. They, well, yes. They're swimming around, they're hunting for food, they're growing, they're just, just, like, just like all animals do. They, they all have to do this. It's an incredibly complex process, you know, one, two, these eggs, these, these eggs just dividing and multiplying. Mm. And it's, it's the complications of this for sea urchins. I mean, just can't think what it's to be like for us. It's exactly the same. I mean, we're exactly the same. Um, one cell, then two, then four. Absolutely the same, yes. No difference whatsoever, except for the end product, of course. That's amazing. <laughs> Cells don't stop dividing when you've grown up. In fact, this happens so quickly that you've made enough cells for a new hand every seven weeks. In other words, all the millions of cells that made up the skin of your hand seven weeks ago have died and been replaced by new ones. Now, the dead cells simply fall off or are rubbed off when you dry yourself after washing. Now, if we use grains of sugar to represent cells, and that's all of them, not just your skin, how many do you think you'll make in the time you'll spend with me today? This much. Our bodies will have made 330 million new cells. There are 5.5 million grains of sugar in each bag. So these 60 bags represent the cells our bodies will have made in 20 minutes. 330 million new cells every 20 minutes. This is yeast cells mixed with a sugar solution, and it's part of the process of making beer. Now, every single living cell gives off gas, so the more cells there are, the more gas is given off. Bubbles show that the yeast is respiring rapidly to release energy for cell division, and under a microscope you can see the cells rapidly dividing, much faster than the urchin cells we saw earlier. But how do the yeast cells know what to do? They know what to do because the information is stored in here, in the nucleus. In fact, all the information needed to make you what you are is stored in the nucleus of every cell in your body. For example, the cells in your kneecap have information about the color of your eyes, what type of blood group you are, and whether you're male or female. And because cells divide, and because the nucleus knows what cells are meant to do, human cells can grow outside the body. And how useful this is, how he's investigating. I'm a great big lump of cells. In fact, we all are around 10,000 billion of the things. But what worries me is what happens if we lose some? What happens if I lose some? Can I regrow them? Can someone else regrow them for me? If this investigation, I'm going to have to seek out someone who really knows. So I've come to see Robin Martin at the Blonde Mackindo Centre in East Grinstead. Here, they actually grow skin in the laboratory to help treat burns patients like Teresa here. And because the skin they're growing comes from the patient, they know it won't be rejected by the body. But first, they've got to choose the right cells, because not all cells in the body are the same. Right, what we've got here is a section through some human fingertip skin. At the top here, on the outside, there's layers of dead cells. These are the live cells called keratinocytes, and underneath is some, the tissue called dermis. So all these different cells in the human body doing different jobs, can they all divide? 
Well, most of them can divide, but some cells uh, don't divide after they finish their useful job. For example, in this section of skin, these upper cell layers, these cells are dead. They were produced from the lower cell layers, and these are the ones who di which divide. Now, for example, if you were to get a cut on your finger, these cells would divide, multiply, and migrate, and fill in the gap. Now, that's what happens when you, you, your cut on your finger heals. So in your lab you're trying to grow the skin cells? Yes, what we can do is grow these lower cells. These are the ones that divide very rapidly. What we do is we take a piece of skin and those cells can be put out into special culture medium and they settle down on the base of the culture flask and begin to divide. So how much skin do you need? Well, for example, if we took a 1p piece of skin, we could separate the keratinocytes out into culture dishes and we could in theory grow sheets of skin to cover an adult human in three to four weeks from a one piece of skin. That's amazing. So this is the medium they're grown in? No, there are actually four million cells in here. How small are they? Well you could fit 400 of those cells on the head of a pin. So what happens next? Well in four or five days these cells would have grown and covered the bottom of that flask and then we've got a sheet of skin. You can see here that it's been put onto a, a, the, a white dressing and the dressing can be um, lifted up with the skin cells attached. And this now can be given to the surgeon in theatre and that could be flapped onto the patient. And just stuck on? Yes. The dressing will um, protect the skin cells for the first few days and then that can be removed. Leaving new skin in its place? We hope, yes. <laughs> These body parts look gruesomely realistic, but they're fake. Is there going to be a time when we can grow body parts? Well, I, I think there will be a time. We've got to remember that these parts, um, a real ear, is skin and other sorts of cells and blood vessels and some cartilage. And scientists are working on combining all the different sorts of cells and reforming them into a tissue in the laboratory. So I think within 10 to 15 years, we will be able to grow parts like this. So, if you can only do single cells, how about this? <clears throat> I, need you to, I need to grow some more muscles, what do you reckon? Well, we could think about growing some muscles, but how about going with that to the gym? Oh, it's never easy. It's a real pity this plane isn't made out of cells, otherwise it could repair itself. Now, before I go, here's a question for you. When a patient needs a blood transfusion or an organ transplant, one of the first things a doctor tries to find out is if they have an identical twin. Now, why do you think that is? Why isn't an ordinary twin just as good? Well, if two people are identical twins, then that means they've come from the same fertilised egg cell. Yeah, that means that all their cells are identical to their twin. So their blood would be the same and their organs so the body won't reject them. But why not an ordinary twin? Why is that different? 